uh, see or can answer as well. So uh, we do have. Uh, Yes. Oh, right. Oh, right. Excuse me. Oh, right. Oh, right. Oh, right. Oh, right. Oh, right. Oh, Charlie Greer at School Board and Building Committee. Yeah, I guess. Probably that. Greer School Board. Mary Good. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
it becomes a sieve. So the water that has gotten behind the facade of this building has finally worked its way through the portico behind the brick and through the portico and into the column, splitting it. We also find as we get inside it that there's an 8x8 timber in there which is actually holding up the portico which is rotted. And this kind of hidden damage is is frankly symptomatic of what we're dealing with all over this complex. There are bits and pieces, in some cases window walls, sills, into the um, or behind roofs or walls or electrical systems and that's one of the reasons why we have to really get into the interior of these buildings, pull them apart and fix them. For anybody who is unaware of what we mean when we talk about window walls, this is um, a, a classic example. This was added, this, this is the, the so-called connector link added to this building is an addition in the 60s. Uh, in fact, the town did a great deal of building in the 50s and 60s because of the baby boom and growth in the town. Those window wall system buildings certainly served their purpose. They did admirably for that time, but they are worn out. Those are single pane windows. They do not work well. The windows themselves now are absolutely, in most cases, uh, barely functioning. Some of them fall out, some of them don't open. And I just suggest to you, imagine the heat loss in that kind of construction today. This is the D-Wing. The plan, uh, which we will be showing you in more detail on the boards, does call ultimately for the demolition of the D-Wing. Uh, we have figured out that bringing that two-story structure up to code, making it a useful building, um, the difference between doing that and taking that square footage and putting it in more functional pieces of the existing middle school, frankly giving a far better traffic flow, a better building, the difference between bringing this one up to code and taking the square footage and putting it someplace else is about 340000 and since that would also free up space for parking and also give us some extra space to allow us to move kids around in the construction phase, the renovation phase, this is the reason behind looking at that, making that choice. This also gives you, a, if you haven't really looked at it, uh, an indication of what we mean by a temporary building. The little white building in back is one of the so-called portables. They're not portable in the sense that they're on wheels. They're portable in the sense that they are temporary. Handicap access is a major issue. Um, frankly, any construction project under ADA standards of 100,000 or more would trigger bringing the entire complex up to um, full ADA code, and that's going to take a lot. Uh, the current plan does talk about putting an elevator in this building and an elevator in the Lunt wing of the Pond Cove, which would uh, give us, finally, decent uh, accessibility. There also, of course, is a plan to rework all the ramps, make them truly functional. This is a picture in the eighth grade, uh, second story a wing in the, the D wing that I just showed you the outside of. The lights are taped because actually they go with the room on the other side of the petition. This is a fairly common problem in the middle school. Walls have been pull down and put back over, over time in order to try to offer some flexibility and spaces. But in the meantime, the general uh, systems, including lighting, heating, and so on, have not been reconfigured to go along with that. Uh, that shower hasn't worked for a generation, by the way. Uh, and really, the main point of having that picture is to prepare you. This is, uh, this, some of these slides were taken as long ago as two years ago when we did the school space study. Uh, Mr. Conley was in a room different from the one he's now in, but that's a ex uh, perfect example of what we mean by dysfunctional windows in the window wall system. And it, obviously, almost everything we talk about or show you in these slides, you might ask, well, why not just fix them? I mean, why, why can't, how can it cost multi-millions of dollars to fix this kind of thing? That single window wall and the whole system is like almost like a panel. It's not just a frame where you fix the window or put another window in. You really basically have to rework the wall of the building. And again, uh, not only do we lose a lot of heat through those uh, old uh, window wall systems, but you can see there's another symptomatic picture of 
rock of some kind, and we don't know at this point exactly how far in that's going, but of course, it's, if it's there, it's also below where you cannot see. Uh, this is a middle school gym, a perfectly uh, usable, good structure built in the 50s. Unfortunately, it does not meet structure, current structure code as far as the roof is concerned. It was leaking and it was re-roofed as part of the projects that were done a few years ago. Unfortunately, those projects were done without the aid of a structural engineer. And after the roof was taken off the first day of school three years ago, uh, we did send a structural engineer to go back over all those projects and find out what needed to be done. This building is usable as it is. However, there are two problems. When it is renovated, we do need to add extra structure because it does not meet current day code. Uh, we do have to shovel if we get more snow on top than um, I think the, if I remember correctly, the report on that one is a foot which is almost um, very unlikely to happen, but it can happen and we have to monitor it. And the other problem in this building is that it doesn't meet current code for lateral stress. Again, neither of those problems for using it day to day, but if we, for instance, were to have a hurricane, we couldn't use this as a hurricane shelter because the structural engineer's report on this building said do not use it in uh, sustained winds of over 45 miles per hour. Those are fixable issues, I should point out. To build a new gym, gym as well over of that size is at least a million dollars, uh, depending on how many bleachers and so on and so forth. <laughs> well worth fixing up, by the way, but it is something that needs to be done. And there are examples all over of stuff like that. This is just a picture to kind of show you that the complex is somewhat incoherent. That is, it doesn't have uh, it was not planned as one building. It wasn't really designed at any stage of its life to be uh, the kind, uh, have the kind of traffic that it now has. Another sample, this is the bottom floor of the D-Wing, a handicap accessibility problem. We put the ramp in. There are door access traffic problems. Moving over to the Pond Cove Lunt building. This, this is actually the Lunt building. It looks as if it were um, attached to Pond Cove. Frankly, that's because there was a portable between uh, Lunt, which was built as a separate building in 1962. Um, the records that I have say it was built for about $180,000. We really have gotten our money's worth out of that building at this point. This is the 1950s swing of the Pond Cove. A major problem for Pond Cove is that it was all parts of it, including Lunt, were really designed for elementary education of uh, 30 years, 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, there was really almost no call at that time for special education, for small group education, and very little call for parents or one-on-one -on -one tutoring, or in this case, some kind of, uh, I think, individual testing. Uh, all of those demands have, have uh, come along with an increased emphasis on individual programming. This has changed the curriculum. There is more need for special spaces, and I don't mean just for special education needs, I mean for um, the special needs of the curriculum, storage, and so on. This is uh, the entrance hall into Lund. It is a totally non-handicap accessible building at the current time. Another problem at Pond Cove is this is the gym. Now, uh, some I have been through that building with a number of groups and also shown these slides to a number of people who are not at all convinced that elementary children need a gym. I have to tell you that the state only reluctantly allows us to use this for elementary programs. You can see that the posts are padded. Uh, since this slide was taken, those lights have been replaced because they were subject to fairly frequent breakage. Uh, we are very concerned that we have to store our cafeteria tables here. Those also are a hazard, uh, but we don't have any choice. And in fact, the, uh, these old all-purpose rooms is a cafeteria for uh, over 500 children or two hours in the middle of the day. It can't be used as a gym space. Obviously, that impacts gym. We put as many children as we can into the middle school gym, but since we have over 1,100 youngsters now between these two buildings, you simply can't put everybody in the gym program in both buildings in one gym. 
It's absolutely impossible to schedule it. So as much as possible, grades one, two, and three do have their gym outside, but there's clearly a limit to what can be done there. This is just a slide to remind people how elementary school programs have changed. The classroom now is really devoted to centers, um, small group activities. There are times, of course, when the teacher groups them, as you can see here. But uh, notice all the various materials there. We are having an acute problem of storage in order to have all of these individual hands-on kinds of activities. This is probably the best slide in here for the storage problem. Uh, the fire chief has absolutely put his foot down on this kind of situation. We almost didn't open up this file. We had to sit down and negotiate with the fire chief, with the staff, uh, with our maintenance people. We had to create some, some, uh, some covered boxes. The teachers, frankly, had to throw stuff out. Uh, we simply didn't have storage, and in fact, in today's uh, Portland uh, um, article on some of our problems was a picture of Beth Anderson standing in the one space in that building that the fire chief told us we can uh, convert to storage because it's an old boiler room and it has fire rated walls. This is a non-sprinkler building and obviously we were anxious to conform to the fire codes and the teachers certainly have done an admirable job of uh, doing what they can but it is uh, it's just a constant problem. Actually, that's in there because it's gross. And it, it sort of speaks for the way I feel about some of these pieces. And of course, one of our problems in, in, the, uh, in Pond Co, this is the boys' bathroom. Of course, we could change the toilet, and of course, we could change the, the stall there. And there has been a lot of work trying to scrub and scrape and clean. The problem is, over years, almost generations we could say, little boys are sometimes <laughs> miss their target. And there is frankly an older problem in this bathroom because urine over the years has seeped into the floorboards and the janitors are frankly absolutely incapable of scraping. They have tried and tried and tried everything we can. It, the floorboards need to come up. The whole thing needs to come out. It's that kind of placement of uh, inner surfaces as well as systems that we're talking about in this kind of major renovation. Again, this was a serviceable heating system in 1948 when it was put in place. Uh, it is not anymore. We're also concerned about the fact that that is in a hall where children are about that height. Uh, we've mentioned about a plastic cover falling off lights. There's one there. That's the kind of plastic cover. They're old and cracked and dried out and fell off. And we have now taken them all off and sleeved those fluorescent lights the, uh, as a temporary measure. But it's, again, another example of something that needs to be totally replaced. This is the uh, first, I guess, of the three portable structures. This one's been in place five years. Unfortunately, uh, the vestibule, not the main part of the building, but the vestibule part was somehow put in in such a way that is all those timbers underneath are now rotted. We discovered that because a child put his foot through. You can kind of see the hole there uh, a few weeks ago. And when our maintenance people got under there and looked, it is that whole uh, piece of the portable, uh, the timbers have rotted and we're going to have to do something. We're going to have to do something <coughs> just to get through the winter. Um, as best we can tell, the main part of the building is okay, but uh, this is another example of Band-Aid problems and Band-Aid solutions. Better picture of the hole. We discovered it because a child put his foot through it. And just in case anybody around here remembers the roof coming off, I have a picture of the trusses. Um, the article in the paper trying to talk about that a little bit, I think, as far as I understand it, got it right. The, uh, that was essentially a band-aid. I mean, that whole re-roofing went on uh, without spending the kind of money on planning and hiring um, a or, or thinking about a long-range plan that you could actually put in place. And the, and the dimensions of the problem are so large that a few band-aids simply don't do it. And we wind up spending money uh, that literally is, uh, if it's doing some good, but most of it. We have in our, the only debt service we have in our budget right now, $216,000, uh, 
is going to pay for some of those roofing things and I, I really question whether that's good. I'm going to slip right over here. I have just a few more slides. Are the models slides in here? And then we can stop for um, It's that small. The little engine that could. Whoops. Okay. Uh, these are slides the architectural firm has taken of the model. The model, by the way, is uh, in Thomas Memorial Library. It is also surrounded with some uh, explanation of the project, some pictures. So again, another source of information. And perhaps the next one. This begins to show what the proposed plan for additional building would be. Remember the slide back there where there was a, a window wall system attached to the old brick building. You can see that that window wall system now is no longer evidently there. The core of it is there. The two-story addition that juts out towards us will be uh, the addition on this side and, it, and there is also a two-story uh, piece on the other side of that. That's a major addition and is the core of the 7th and 8th grade facilities according to this plan. There's a bird's eye view, if you will, and you can see two bold places that kind of face each other across what looks like a mall. Those are both libraries. The one on the near side, the left-hand side of the screen, is what is currently the all-purpose room in Pond Cove. Our, the plan calls for turning that into a library, better space than what is currently being used for, and it faces the uh, library, which uh, will be for the middle school, also both. This again gives you, this is the picture of the proposed model um, with facing where the bus will come in and where the car traffic will come in. Uh, it's actually those entrances now face the high school. You can see quite prominently in this slide the new addition. You can see a, on the left hand side the middle school uh, entrance and the right hand side the Pine Cove entrance and behind them you can see a, um, an addition that bridges the two buildings. On the left hand side of that addition would be a double cafeteria. Uh, with a mechanical wall separating them so that the children from, or the youngsters from middle school would be eating um, on one side and the youngsters from Conco eating on the other so it wouldn't look like one huge cafeteria space. But uh, there would be one kitchen. That is in savings, of course, if you are aware of public building construction, kitchens are expensive to uh, outfit. So that is really quite a savings to put that one together. It also uh, offers both an educational use and a community use because the mechanical wall can be open. And when it's open, that is a seating area of about 600, either of the uh, schools would fit in there. And there will be a small stage on one end, which means that it can then be used for performances, something that we have absolutely no capacity for now for either the Pine Cove or the middle school. We also think it would offer the community uh, really a valuable uh, and very accessible um, structure that we know how much the one, for instance, in the high school is used, we think people would use it a lot. It also, uh, with a gym beside it, the Pond Cove gym, the elementary gym, is much smaller than the middle school or high school gyms. They are built without bleachers, um, but again, it's a proper space for a gym and certainly can be used by the community as well. Another view uh, to give you a sense of how that would look. And if you can see it, I don't know how clear that is. I guess that's as clear as it's going to get. But um, this was, or, or this timeline uh, line was in the supplement in the Courier. I think it is really a very valuable uh, demonstration of how the town built so much in the baby boom years. Uh, really culminating with a 1970 edition of the high school and really hasn't built anything since. And that pattern 
is what's causing a major renovation and addition to happen 23 years after the high school was open. It's time those buildings that were built in the 50s, 40s, 50s, and 60s have really come to the end of their useful life. But not to the end of their total useful life. We can, there's still enough structure and still enough value in those buildings so that this kind of major and thorough renovation plus some new spaces to bring it up to the, the uh, 90s and beyond, uh, it is time to do that. We have retired the debt on the old high school, or on the new high school, I should say. We retired the debt a few years ago. Um, it, that's how that was built, by the way. It was taken out with a 20-year bond. Most of it was local effort. The, lo the, the local effort of that high school uh, in $93 is actually over the 11.7 that we're talking about for this. So having finished that phase, it does, I know it's hard, I know it sounds like a lot, but in some respects it really fits this pattern to go into another period of a 20 year major improvement uh, and it would simply fit the pattern. These are actually things that are either in the supplement or on the boards at the library. They're trying to make the point, I don't know how readable they are at this um, space, but they're trying to make the point that there has been or have been at least three studies done in the last five years and the studies have really defined the problem, come up with solutions. More than 20 options have been studied. Um, Two of the best engineering architectural firms in the area have been hired to give us advice. Um, two citizen groups. Uh, I mean, this, this really has been a long process of trying to sort out the issues. Uh, and in both of these studies, the School of Space Study, published in 91, and the recent one in 93, say over and over again, major systems must be replaced. That's basically what those conclusions are. Uh, need to be rebuilt, rehabilitated, a thorough upgrade of the architectural, mechanical, and the electrical systems. And frankly, uh, it is our, our belief that this is a cost-effective building program will save the taxpayer money over the long term. There's no question, I have to tell you, that in the current budget, I'm, I, I went back over last year, $200,000 in our current budget went to emergency repairs and to uh, for instance, the, the local share of the renting of the portables, uh, and I factored in a few, about $20,000 for energy loss, which I know is a very low figure. I'm sure that it's much higher than that, but I wanted to be conservative. On top of which, the $216,000 that we have in debt service for a total of over $400,000 is basically Band-Aid. Uh, I don't think that's really good business to have $400,000 a year in our budget going for stuff that is absolutely short-term band-aid and isn't going to solve the problem. And if we don't do something, that $400,000 is very likely to become a whole lot more because one of these systems is going to break down, it's going to, or maybe more than one, to the point where we are simply absolutely going to have to make emergency repairs of a grand scale just to keep school going and we'll wind up with another $200,000 in bond payments for stuff that doesn't really do it. I just don't think that's good business. And a major issue that I haven't mentioned at all in these is the traffic safety. Um, one of the things that certainly is clear when you look at that model is that this does completely change the traffic pattern. Essentially, the uh, access road that's over here on the left on the other side of the field, this proposal does keep this field. It supplants the access road with a regular two-way driveway, moving it as close as possible to the uh, playing field so that it moves as far as possible up Scott Dyer Road. And then that becomes the access to parking as well as parent drop-off. Um, we're separate, separating out bus traffic coming up through Jordan Way and going out through the high school and separating that traffic, giving plenty of parking spaces and so on, is truly important. In addition, uh, it's very likely we will continue to make some use of both buildings with students so that instead of having to have them cross the yard here during the day with traffic, uh, which is going on now, um, we will feel much more comfortable being able to share some of those spaces back and forth. I think that probably
probably covers most of it. Those are some other, some of you might have some questions about asbestos. There's an estimate for asbestos removal. And yes, it is a conservative estimate. It does not talk about panicking about asbestos. Uh, I think basically, I think much of that has already been covered. So, somebody want to turn the lights on? Please. I guess, frankly, that lays out the groundwork, and we're here to answer questions and make comments. Is there any way we could just move some microphones over here so we can just talk? I think we're waiting for questions. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, Connie, the first thing I'd like to do is thank <laughs> everyone that's worked so hard, because I know a lot of effort's gone in over the years on this program. Uh, selfishly, I'd like to, and I don't think there's any way to do it, and I'm not going to dwell on it, but I'd like to, I'd like to see the approval of um, the capital proposal to fix the schools tied into a more rapid change in the curriculum because I would gladly, gladly play, pay the, uh, you know, roughly $800, for instance, for supplementing the math program towards the school project um, in lieu of, of spending it outside of the school system. Um, but that aside, I have some questions regarding kind of the pricing of all this, and that was, how was the pricing developed? Was it an architectural estimate? Would it be considered conservative, aggressive? It's a conservative estimate, estimate, but it is not a labor and materials takeoff that you would do later on in the project. We established certain levels of uh, renovation, <clears throat> and based on our experience uh, and analysis of the existing conditions, applied various square foot numbers to those levels of renovation. And then for the new construction, where there are additions to the various parts of the building, we applied what is, in fact, a statewide average for this type of new construction uh, that would be appropriate for this. What kind of contingency are you carrying at this stage? Um, it's 10 percent. Uh, seems a little low. Not really. 10 uh, percent for this type of project seems, is fairly reasonable. Uh, That's for fact. both design and construction yes. contingency? Yeah, because um, in the one hand, you have unknowns because it is renovation. On the other hand, you don't have the site unknowns, which you do in a new project, like uh, ledge and, and bad soil conditions, which sometimes cause major impacts. In fact, as you get later on in the project, you might be able to reduce the contingency slightly. But I think at this point in the project, that is, uh, that is a reasonable contingency, and it's one that matches what the state recommends. After the school is, constru you know, it is constructed and repaired, how much is anticipated to be budgeted annually for, you know, just normal capital replacement maintenance? I mean, where you draw the line, I realize, is, you know, is kind of academic. But you mentioned, Connie, two hundred thousand dollars for capital for the, I think 1993 in the existing facilities, and in order to keep the facilities up to a, a level 
that they'll sustain themselves. I would suspect that that order of magnitude going forward is is also a realistic number. That two hundred thousand, and let's mm, separate it out. One hundred thousand is just emergency repair over and above the regular budget. Uh, for instance, in the school budget. Um, we have in excess of 400,000, but a lot of that is personnel and so forth, uh, you know, kind of built-in costs, uh, paper costs of one kind or another, custodial costs. Uh, I'm talking about in addition to, I mean, that 100,000 was for a heating, uh, a series of crises in just to keep this plant going and Pond Cove going and to some degree, we also discovered some problems in the high school. I am concerned about the lack of preventive maintenance uh, over the years at the high school. I am going to have to make sure that the budgets do reflect um, making, we do believe we've caught that one, but at the same time, it's certainly going to require additional effort. There is some bleaching, or not that's not bleaching, bleaching, is that the right word, in the concrete at the high school that I've been told needs to be brought up and so forth. I mean, the high school is 23 years old. So that what I won't have to spend in emergency repairs, I would certainly anticipate transferring over through the operating budget to the high school. Um, but I'm, that, that figure that I'm mentioning is in addition to our normal operating expenses. What I think another piece of your question, if I hear you correctly, would be what plans are we making to make sure that we have a decent preventive maintenance program? And, um, I think the piece in the Portland paper was quite accurate. I explained that we had been rebuilding our custodial maintenance um, operations and they are notably better than they were. And we also uh, will be reflecting that in our budget appropriations every year. I guess I, 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 you've answered part of the, the question that I've asked. It's more an issue of not so much the operations and even the maintenance and janitorial. Because I suspect that for a lot of the capital work that I'm referring to, to keeping the building roofing systems, those sorts of things, and the, and the condition they should be in, that you, the expertise of the maintenance staff probably is not such that they would be performing that work. So, I mean, after you built the structure, in addition to the normal operating um, maintenance, there's also things wear out over time. Right. I mean, if they don't, roofs don't last 20 years, they say they're gonna last, and, and those sorts of things. So specifically, I'm wondering how much is it gonna cost I mean, or what, what's the professional opinion as to what should you allocate for a $12 million structure to expect to expend beyond normal operating expenses, the cleaning, the painting, those sorts of things, for capital replacement? And I would guess an order of 3 to 5% is not an unreasonable number, no and I think that would roughly estimate come to the 200000 that's been spent on the uh, emergency It repair. may not be, and frankly, I don't have that number. I'm sure that there are uh, rules of thumb in uh, building uh, facilities management groups. And I think one of the things that, that Connie has pointed out is a significant improvement in the professional level of the, of the facility management staff here in Cape Elizabeth in, in just a recent uh, year or so. Uh, and that staff also uh, is focusing on future maintenance and upkeep of those buildings. They're not looking at it from the standpoint of, here's a problem, I have to deal with it. They're looking at it from the standpoint of, what are the problems going to be five years from now, and then budgeting accordingly. And I think uh, that staff is going to make a significant impact on the budgeting characteristics in the future years. Also, there's one other thing, uh, if I can add, uh, there, there will also be cost savings in terms of operating these buildings. Uh, Connie pointed out the single pane uh, glass walls and the curtain walls. And in fact, if you look at those walls, the steel frame of the building is outside and inside, which means that that steel on the inside is 20 degrees when it's 20 degrees outside. So that means that there's going to be a significant savings in energy cost in the buildings. Well, one of the things that I saw in, in the newspaper articles is 20%. And given the level of construction, 20% savings seemed like a, a very low estimate yes. of savings given right. what, what sort of system are they expecting to use for heating? That's a, that's a, that is a very conservative estimate. And I think that's based simply on replacing the systems and upgrading the envelope to some degree. There will be additional savings because 
the whole footprint of the building is going to be significantly more compact. Sure. So right now, you've got the railroad car uh, approach, so you have a lot more exterior wall than you will in the future. Uh, so I think that the 20% is significantly uh, conservative at this point. Uh, the, the type of system will be a, uh, currently it's a steam system, it will likely be a forced hot water system with a lot more localized control. Uh, and then, of course, there will also be a ventilation system, which in many cases we don't have any of at this point, except for the current. Who budgets for capital currently <laughs> in, going, in going forward? Some of us heard that. I'm sorry. Who budgets for the capital, Connie? I do, or when I put the budget together. Obviously. But I mean, the, the input. I mean, it, it's part of my responsibilities. Budgeting things for capital, right. for buildings, is a very complex thing. And I'm just. I'm very concerned as an, when we look at the numbers that the initial cost, as scary as that is to me, um, I'm, I'm concerned about the cost as we go forward and if the capital budgeting isn't done professionally, I don't mean professionally, you're not professional, but in terms okay. of people that yeah, have the agree. expertise, the, the, you know, the, the mechanical engineers, the roofing engineers, those sorts of people that we're apt to get ourselves in the same sort of problem. And what I'm a little concerned about is that I feel that I'm, I'm upset about the cost of this project. And I've got two children in the grammar school now, and as you mentioned, the high school is roughly 23, 22 years old. And I'm afraid that by the time my children get to the high school, we're going to be sitting here and I'm going to be replacing the high school because of the lack of appropriate capital expenditures on that structure. And so the initial expense is a shock. I understand, let's forget what's been done in the past, but as we go forward, I want to make sure that we don't repeat these same mistakes. And I want to make sure that there's a mechanism in place, a professional mechanism, to make sure that these buildings are taken care of. And that's not to speak to the administrative staff or to the maintenance staff, but as it relates to capital, I see I see that being a separate discipline uh, that requires expertise that probably would not exist within the existing maintenance staff. Well, I understand what you're saying in general. I've been in a, you know, I've been a superintendent for 11 years, and my degree, all my degrees, are not in this. But I have also uh, taken seriously the obligation to understand how to run a school system. And in fact, what I knew as a teacher and a principal in school systems for years is that schools have always traditionally skimped on this. It's because people think of schools as a place where the teacher and the program and my child with this teacher, that is the model, the mental model, if you will, that people have of schools. And school boards, year in, year out, will bring forward budgets to the community and I have seen maintenance cut over and over and over again in every system I have ever worked in. And what we are now into, this whole rush of baby boom 50s and 60s buildings and every community around here is facing the same problem we are, fixing them up, adding to them, trying to make them energy efficient, bring them up to the code for the 20th century, et cetera, et cetera, 21st century. Um, all of that is, is demanding a level of expertise of school systems that has, frankly, not been accepted practice in small school systems. That was one of the things that I insisted, both in, my, in the other town I was superintendent and here, is that I would hire somebody who had some bridging, not that I, I knew I couldn't afford to have a team of engineers, but somebody who had some bridging to analyze things properly and give me and the school board proper uh, information. I knew immediately when I walked in the door three years ago, as soon as I understood that they'd done a, mil a million dollar or close to a million dollar re-roofing without hiring an AE firm and a structural engineer who knew right off what to do about it, send them right back through everything and check it. Because I had learned the importance of going to that level of expertise. Now I don't pretend to be the world's biggest expert, but what I have learned and many of my fellow superintendents have also learned in the last 10 years is that you have to go and get the help and the expertise that you need. We're still a small system. It will be arguably hard to sell every year in every budget all the kinds of things that a private industry would be able to put into its budget. But this kind of situation, I think the roof trusses, the reason I had the slide in there with the roof trusses, 
I'm assuming the community's consciousness about this has been raised and that they appreciate the level of expertise that we have gone to in order to produce this report. This is definitely not just coming out of a group of teachers or me or even the school board. It's coming out of the professionals that we have been hiring. And we intend to follow that same way of going to the right kinds of uh, level of expertise in order to get that advice so we don't uh, make the same mistakes. Uh, what happens, I'm not fully aware, I mean I understand emergency repairs will still need to be done, but there must be some sort of a contingency plan should the referendum not pass. And I'm just curious as to what that is and what are we talking in terms of dollars? Um, frankly, there isn't. And I'll tell, you, I'll tell you exactly what I will advise the board if it fails. I will say, number one, we have to find out why. And I don't mean to go hire Price Waterhouse or somebody to go you know, get an absolute polling, but some kind of systematic way to find out why. Because why means is the community not able to do it or doesn't want to do it. And before we could go any further, we would have to understand that. The second thing is this problem has been studied to death. There's absolutely no point in getting uh, another architectural engineering firm in here to come up with another analysis. We have plenty of data to show that we have identified the problem. Number three, when I put this year's budget together with the help of all the various people in the departments and the teachers and the principals and so forth, yes, of course, we'll put in a healthy chunk for emergency repairs. But there is no other contingency outside of waiting to the net for the next emergency and going out to uh, to the council for a smaller bond a million dollar bond for instance to fix some part of the heating system um, there is no other responsible way that we can take care of this problem and run school I mean, if this was an empty warehouse if this was the mall that was empty and all you really had to do was make some decisions about how you were going to deal with the building that would be one set of issues we have over 1,100 children going to school right here. There is no systemic heating, window wall, roofing, inside uh, surface structures, lighting. You can't do that in a summer. And it means that you would have to do piece by piece by piece, which is what this plan calls for. So uh, just renovating by using renovating costs we're up to eight or nine million dollars and that's without additional spaces or replacing the portables. So what, what, what other plan is there? I mean there might arguably be some other kind of way of adding new spaces or not adding new spaces and we, you know those are right there for people to look at. Do um, you want to really use this room for cafeteria for the foreseeable future? I mean this is not, not a very acceptable space frankly. Um, that's the only answer I have. People have been asking me that a lot. And I hope that I'm clear, and there are members of the building committee here too. Paul is the chair. He came in after we all introduced ourselves. There isn't any plan B that is acceptable but a little cheaper. Well, the, the, the reason for the question, because I, I do not disagree with you that the facilities need major renovations. However, and I think this meeting is maybe representative. Maybe people have made up their minds that it needs to be done, but I'm a little concerned that the support may not be there. <laughs> Me too. And, and that's a tremendous concern. And I was just curious as to, to what other you know, things were in mind other than continue the kind of the Band-Aid approach. I don't know of any, if you could come, if somebody can actually discuss with the building committee, with the school board, with me. I mean, I'm not the only one here that thought about this. I don't know if there isn't any good alternative. I mean, would it go to referendum again a year from now, or? That's not my decision, though. I mean, I just make a comment as a non-building committee member. I think a lot of the contingencies were eliminated before the decision was made for this plan. Uh, we had a policy subcommittee meeting last month where we talked about what some of the alternatives are. And quite frankly, none of them are anything you want your children involved with. When 40% or potentially 40% of our principal and interest on this bond um, could be spent in one year for an emergency, 
that just doesn't make sense and that's just you know in one year so I have personally um, tried to come away with well this has to pass because Cape residents are logical people um, and they will by the time November 2nd comes know why the reasons why this conclusion was made uh, the the options quite frankly Jimmy are not they're really not good ones and I, I would I, hate I, to have option B out there and then have to live with it as a school board member. No, and no, that's I, just my personal, you know. And I don't have a hidden, trying to keep a secret here, I know the answer, and, and this is Ned. I think the major renovation is is the solution, but I'm also a little bit of a realistic, and I realize that I it doesn't I appear to be a lot of outward <laughs> support. Well, one, of, there's basically two options, as I see it, if you look at it very simply. One of them involves floating a bond, going to referendum, having a bond passed, and then doing some significant change to the building. And we looked at basically three options which have been noted several times in the past. One is to just renovate, and the bare bones renovation is $9 million, and it maintains all the same problems with the building. The other option is to, to do the whole works, bulldoze it, and then you're looking at 16 to 18 million dollars. Both of those were rejected by the building committee for obvious reasons. They tried to develop what was an appropriate um, solution that was econo relatively economical for the space needed, and that, that was what they came up with. So rather than come up with three options, two of which seemed very poor and, and one good one, they tried to do the best they could, came up with one option. So, and I would agree with that, that system. So that leaves you with two options. One is either a bond is approved or is it, it is not. If it is not, then you have to try to make do with what you have. And if that goes on to next year, my concerns are that my personal feeling is that mo many parts of the buildings would need to be con would be condemned. They're, they're not they're not habitable as they are. And and if code violations are continue to be addressed, you would run into problems as you read about all across the country in New York. Children just don't go to school. The school is out for three months while they pull asbestos. Uh, school would have to be shut down while the heating system in the wintertime. They couldn't go to school in the wintertime because the heating system simply does not work so they'd go in the summertime. And those, those are the type of problems that will be inescapable if we continue with the concept of, well, we'll try again next year, we'll try again next year. So there, there is no realistic or acceptable contingency plan. I, I can't think of any way of providing for one. Either, either a bond is passed or it isn't. If it isn't, then the only thing you can do is try to deal with the problems as they arise, which, which will be impo an impossible task. Given that, and again, I, I support the project, although I have reservations, because it's linked to other things within, within the system. And I realize that it's, it's a late date to even be asking maybe this question. Um, so what can I or anyone else as an individual do other than to speak positively about it to other people in town? What can we do as residents to, to do as much as possible for you know, a vote in, that it will occur? A yes vote. I, I guess I would say that Ann and I have tried to think of everything from all the tours Connie has given to the information in the Cape Courier that we labored over writing, the direct mail piece, and I mean we labored over writing these things to try to be as unbiased as possible, the display in the library. We talked about going to all kind of community groups in this town. Our response was not great um, with people wanting to hear from us. There were, what, five or six copies given in neighborhoods. The um, People haven't really come out for that kind of stuff. There was a middle school parents um, association meeting. Um, what other things? The, it's been on cable TV. We have tried to do everything we can think of. and. If anybody can think of more, I guess it's to call your neighbors to talk about it and to ask, you know, see if they support it. If they don't, try to answer their questions and get people to vote because it really is pretty crucial. Um, like, you know, we really have tried to think of everything we could do. I think the, uh, if I may add, the reason that there's no plan B to speak of, a real practical plan B, is that as the committee coalesced a year ago, uh, we were struck with the urgency of the situation and we were struck with the notion that we really had to come up with the best plan and this had to go forward so that's that's where that sort of comes from uh, is that sense of urgency that this really has to go forward and frankly we're all just astounded 
that there's been just tremendous apathy uh, in the community about this. And I appreciate your willingness to want to do something now. As long as it's not stand on the million dollar bridge in a monkey suit with a sign. We're all How about the dump? Would you do the dump for us? I have a sign for uh, But uh, uh, frankly, the, it, we've just, the, the, the silence has been deafening. And I, I'm surprised by that. I am too. Because I know the conditions are such. I mean, I was, I mentioned the Rosemary thing was just last night on the phone. That it, just recently, my son's in the Pond Cove School, and I went to chaperone a trip up to the Cumberland Fair. So I was in, at the school at like 8 30, 9 o'clock in the morning. And I went in to use the restrooms, and I left without using the restrooms. I was disgusted by the condition of the facilities. Um, and I don't want my either one of my sons in those sorts of, of facilities. So I mean, I agree it's a necessary thing, but again, if there's anything that, that I can do, or I think there are probably others that are supportive of it, that, and, I, and I, I hear what you're saying, you know, it's been there, but how much people have really paid attention to it, I'm not really sure. I think if you just talk it up. Just I'd talk. like to kind of address part that I'm, uh, I've had two, two kids, I have one in the middle school now, I've got another one come through, and I, I, I basically have some concerns. Uh, I, I know that the school needs work. I mean, I, this school's needed work ever since my first one went through. There, is, uh, there are uh, other priorities being taken into account at that time, so that's, that's, that's going to spill the milk, and the schools were not considered to be the priority, the buildings were not the priority. Some of my concerns with the plan, and, and Basically, and I think a lot of people probably are feeling this, is that I don't see any new child space. I see just the same space with a new frame around it. Um, I, and I think that's hard to understand when you're spending $11.5 million. Where, are, where is all the new classroom space, the expansion of, of, of resources? Where are the new rooms for, for, for the kids to learn in? Um, we have, we're building space to replace old space. And, it, and I think that's some of the feelings. It, you know, it, traditionally, whenever a school project was done, it, it was an expansion project. It, it was providing new space for kids to, new, new rooms, new, new, new media rooms, new computer space, new, uh, new learning centers. A lot of this, besides, unfortunately, what comes out as the new space is the gymnasium and, and the cafeteria. And a lot of people don't, don't have that as top priority. Well, the 7th and 8th grade wings would be that's, brand new. That would be brand new. But there's no additional space. But there, and well, that, also a, that, that is new space. And it's also de no, there's no. also designated science space. My understanding, is, maybe I'm, uh, space. my understanding is there's no additional square footage. For, for classrooms. That's because what we're doing is uh, get, doing away with the portables, which are which can't go forward anyway, and uh, we're also not rehabbing the top floor of this building or this space, and so that's out of the equation. You're, you are doing some rehabbing here, I hope. You're, you're putting new pipes in, you're putting new 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 windows in, you're doing some rehabbing. But it's not being used as cl classrooms, well, it's, it's certainly yeah. as a cafeteria. And, 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 and the top floor is not being used. The top floor right. would just be surface rehab, but not yeah. and, See, and held in reserve. Others. But that's some of the issues, I think, that haven't come out very strongly. But the, why? I, I think, um, and I think maybe to address the issue of, of the total square footage of the building, currently you actually don't have a major space deficit here. You have ample square footage in, in just raw numbers. The problem is it's in the wrong place and it's in the wrong formation. It's got the wrong types of rooms. So although there's not a great gain in gross square footage, there's a gain in, in uh, square footage for uh, small group instruction, for media, for computers. Things that you are missing in your current plan are being addressed, but you don't actually need more space. I think you maybe get four or 5,000 more square feet, but what you do need are media centers. These things in blue are new media centers. Computer rooms, these things in yellow are, are new computer rooms. Also, small group instruction space, which you currently have a real deficit. That's this kind of off-green color. All those, all those uh, rooms are uh, special ed or small group instruction rooms, which you currently don't have. So what this plan does try to address is the program deficits, which are not necessarily square footage deficits, but are program deficits. 
the science issue is the most startling example of that. We have absolutely no science rooms throughout from grades one through eight, except for the old science lab that is a hangover from the uh, 60s high school building uh, and has no gas and one leaky sink and so on. This plan takes some square footage, some of it added, but some of it what is already in place and makes sure that grades five, six, seven, and eight have two science rooms, and we're not calling them labs see. because they would be fitted up yeah. not as in the idea of a high school lab, which is not necessarily appropriate for that grade level, but for the age and, and stage where the youngsters are, as well as a major space at Pond Cove that is called a science learning lab in the sense that it would be. But the great need, obviously, especially for the little kids, is to have the space and to have something that can be set up where things can be left um, instead of the pitiful little corners of the janitor's closet they're being forced to use now. That's a major impact on curriculum. I think that the, this also offers us the opportunity as part of the movable equipment line that's in the budget to hire a good consultant and get our handle on what is the future as best anybody can tell us for uh, wiring the entire complex for the appropriate approach to computers uh, and whatever else, God knows whatever else is involved in all of that down the road. Uh, we have no hope of doing that kind of major rethinking of uh, making this a really technically appropriate complex in our regular budget. This is, those are major comp curriculum impact areas. But having, being a, a, a working in that field, right. it, it would be a major mistake to do anything. In, in these grand renovations without wiring this building to the fullest. Yeah, that's exactly that's what I'm now. saying. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, you don't have to hire it, you just keep pulling wire. Okay, fine. <laughs> that's basically what you do. You pull as much as you can. Which wire but, to pull. But, but, oh, but yeah. I, mean, I can tell you that too. But the technology is also such that within the next five, five years, years, you're talking wireless. Yeah. So, right. I mean, that's right. maybe. That gets, maybe. It's but I mean, that gets to having an expert. That's that my point. Has, I mean, my point is to get the help. And, and the hardware or the software or the wiring or whatever you call it at a time when there's a budget available to do it and we'll never be able to do that properly through our regular operating budget. Well, I'm, I'm surprised that the wiring is not a major issue in this building, in all these buildings, because, in, because of the, uh, the inter energy conservation that we've been talking about, any new modern building is, is being run by, by computers, the heating sure. system, the lighting system, yes. the water system, everything is computer operated and run. If you don't do that right off. I'm, I'm very, I'm concerned no. that you're going to have to tear out and start digging into the wall. No, the whole no, system would be on a, on a uh, DMS right. uh, central system, all the buildings. So they are going to be wired. Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, then that's. But well, see, I, I got false info. Well, not false information. I, I got information from from some areas where they were demonstrating this. Where I asked about uh, additional space for their students. The question is, there's no additional space. Well, there is. <laughs> But it's just—it's it's, 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 it's a configuration. It's not, you know, just space. That's exactly. Yeah. I, I think it's also important to note that, to the extent that we could, we've studied the demographics and what we can anticipate coming, and we plan for what we can anticipate. Of course, you know, things can change. But one benefit of having the linked building is that it, it makes the space much more flexible. It, it, it has been a major issue moving rates back and forth between these buildings. That would make that kind of uh, that kind of transition much, much easier. We also have the top future. floor of this building to decompress into if we need to. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, again, <coughs> I, 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 have, I know there's something that needs to be done. Um, some of the issues are just that I haven't received what I consider was as, as sufficient information. Um, you know, but the paper articles are very nice and that, but they're very quiet. And I've been talking and I haven't gotten this. This is a very good meeting to get this information. Um, it's, it's one of the things we talk about in the going the tours on Saturday is gives uh, us an opportunity to point out to people the lack of science, the lack of this, the lack of that, and how that same space can be reconfigured into something that will be curriculum friendly. I mean, there's just so much draining of staff and student energy in the wrong ways. And some of it just piddly little things every day, but some of it much more obvious in a, in a direct <coughs> curriculum way. And we, that does give us an opportunity to kind of keep pointing that out to people. The other thing I'm interested in, and I, and I know there's nothing you can do about it, but I assume this is going to take two years or so to yes. complete. 
what, well, in the meantime, if you have major system failures, what, what are the contingency plans then? <laughs> I mean, we're, we're right now what we're doing is praying not that it doesn't happen. But the reason we're rushing this is because we're saying it may happen in the next year. Um, so, well, that, so those contingency plans are for the next year. I wouldn't say we're rushing year. this. I wouldn't want people to have the impression this has been rushed because, as Connie said, years. this is really the third. <laughs> the yeah. third it's been 20 years. The third study. Well, Maine, that, that's a rush. No, that's <laughs> 20 years. <laughs> But it's only within the last three years that we've looked at the really total looking. systems, not looking at populations and what we do with populations. The first time, you know, in the five years, the last three years have been spent looking at the buildings. And actually, the school space study came out of, of the portable situation. Why do we need portables? And we were and we were um, created to to look at that. What, what, where are we going to put kids? And once the, that school space study committee formulated and they took a tour of these buildings, then they realized that we had more than just where we put kids. It's what we're putting kids in. That's the trouble. And, they're all, <laughs> and the problem, I, I, you're I, I talking about a contingency. The problem is everything is so interrelated. The, the, the traffic patterns, the safety of the traffic patterns, um, the systems themselves, the configurations of the buildings, um, and if you and as Connie said, the minute you spend now a hundred thousand dollars or more, ADA kicks in. That's the um, Disabilities Act, and that means that you've got to spend a million dollars to upgrade all of these facilities for ADA, and, and it may not be effectively spending money. No, I understand. So that's that. so interrelated. I understand the interrelation and all that, and I agree with someone over here saying in that the 100,000, the 200,000 is probably, it's probably not going to go away. We're still going to be spending that just to, if, if, if we don't spend it, uh, other than this, well, then we're committing a crime against the buildings again, and, and 10, 15 years we're going to be in the same boat. Yes. Excuse me, but I think there's a lady behind oh, who's oh. trying to yeah. go ahead. Going comment. off your um, comment, what about the kindergarten? Are, is it in this new plan, are you bringing that back? No. Let me, I think the major perspective there is picking up on the point about the projections. One of the things that is impossible for any of us, and I've not seen, maybe there is a report somewhere, but I, I, none of the people we've consulted have brought it forth. Um, people in the 70s, including this town, got caught with overbuilding. The high school was overbuilt for the actual number of youngsters. Nobody, however, could predict the pill generation. I mean, that was a social phenomenon that, that, that sort of uh, caught a lot of school districts uh, with buildings that they turned around and sold and so on. So most of us are rather conservative now. We are seeing the baby boom let. That is, there was this increase in the 80s that are the children of the baby boomers. And there is that interesting question out there. Are we going to see another uh, decline in enrollment that will shadow the whatever term you want to put on the non-baby boomers. Uh, if so, then we may, we, we may down the road see some decline if that's just a demographic swing in a fairly stable, non, not particularly growing area such as this one. Uh, with that in mind, as well as simply taking the figures that we can predict, we felt that um, uh, part of the options that the, the various groups have looked at uh, is how to maximize the space at the high school. And that did result in putting the kindergarten there. So we, and in doing that, we uh, figured out how many kids we can, for the high school use we need, how many grades we could put in and so forth. And we're comfortable that there'll be some tightening up as the larger grades go through the high school, but there's still sufficient space to run the high school program and keep the kindergarten there. Uh, the kindergarten can go back to Pond Cove if there is a decline in the pattern of enrollment. If we overbuild at Pond Cove at this particular time, we could wind up with a situation such as this town wound up with, with the high school, with many community people feeling that they're paying for empty space. And that does not seem prudent, <coughs> and so the committee has made the best judgment it can, the architects looking at the enrollment figures. Um, there's a good chance that there might be some decline down in the future, and at that point, the kindergarten would go back 
with the others. In the meantime, that decision is working well where it is. It's just the, the kindergarten class now. Yeah. It's the largest class. It in is the, the largest class right. in the history, right? To go through. No, there. Yeah. We this town Not used to have classes in the 200. Okay, so so given this class right now, mm -hmm. if they were seniors or when they're seniors, mm -hmm. they can fit. Yeah. In the high school, no problem with the kindergarten still. That's 12 years down the road, and it would be real hard to predict all the other factors that would come. But theoretically, theoretically. the real issue, the interesting issue, last year's kindergarten was the smallest one we've had in a number of years. And when you start loading buildings, you take not just single classes, you take combinations of classes because it's the average number of children in the building, obviously. Uh, so we are looking very with a great deal of interest to see what kind of kindergarten will be coming in this year. For some reason, every, uh, just about every elementary school in this area is seeing a phenomenally large kindergarten this year. And yet they've also been seeing smaller kindergartens and we're all kind of waiting to see what happens because it's hard to predict what's out there before kindergarten. Honey, with, with the, and I'm going to be optimistic and assume it passes when yeah. we build a, you know, the, the school system in a, and with the special education program, and the changes we're seeing in the curriculum and we'll see in the future in the curriculum, I would suspect that the Cape will become a magnet again for people interested in education. And aside from the fact that the bubble that's coming through just through normal demographics and people having children and the age groups, has it been factored into these plans accommodating kind of this magnet effect of, you know, because it's, as you said, other towns, their facilities are starting to wane. Um, they will probably be in the unfortunate position of not having the financial resources or having the town in a position to, to deal with it. We have low debt service at this point in time. We have a relatively affluent community. Um, not everyone has those advantages. And has that been factored into the well, the two parts to your question, uh, on, you know, the, the, as a matter of fact, most of the towns around here started doing something about the buildings in the 80s. Many of them all, our neighbor Scarborough, 19% of their budget is debt service right now, and they have in fact been through a great deal of local effort. They're finally getting, I guess you might say, the fruits of that, but they're also a growing town. That is, they have many kids out in portables, and there is a lot of, of uh, housing growth in Scarborough. Um, and they're getting help from the state so that they're actually getting a middle school for 600 children. Just to give you relative cost, 600 kids, a, approximately $10 million building, we're trying to fix up for 1,200 kids at 11.7. We have to do it at local effort because for two reasons. Number one, we're not, our population growth is, is simply not there. The demographics are not showing uh, and on paper, we have the square footage. So, and we haven't done anything uh, as far as building or major renovation of any of our buildings as most of our neighbors have. Everybody has done something, even Falmouth, which is uh, only, uh, it, there are some differences. Uh, we are, we do, by the way, get subsidy. I should point that out. We're not getting the state aid for construction. But Falmouth, for instance, doesn't get any state aid. Yarmouth doesn't get any state aid. They built a middle school. Yarmouth built a middle school with local money. Um, and Falmouth built a small addition with local money. Uh, Scarborough has done quite a lot with local money, but now they're getting the state money. So there are all those pieces of things. But going back to your, your other question, which is what's going to happen if we become a man and people start moving here? Well, we're 12 square miles. Not all of that is usable uh, property. What? Yeah, <laughs> Scarborough and Wyndham and Gorm are, uh, they just simply, you just look at the map. I mean, you know, they've got a lot more land and um, it's one of the reasons I'm sure why they're getting the state aid to build more. Uh, those, are, those are all ponderables that are, are, that are hard to gauge and frankly, um, the odds are not with us to build more than what we can prudently uh, predict for now. And just to be aware that if that kind of growth occurs, and we too get on the on the line for state aid, uh, because that's the kind of thing that they support. As Mike pointed out, too, there is some expansion plan. The second floor of this building could provide additional classrooms if if the need was there. What's the current plan for the second floor? You kind of just mothballing it. 
then another thought was where the libraries are that we that, that that's another logical place where the buildings could be linked at some point there's also a spot in Pond Cove you know where that where the breezeway is now where the entrance yes. that's another logical place you could build build on to in the future so I mean, we did think about things that could be done down the line if we need the space but right now we really don't need the space these questions about demographics that you've had uh, I think are important ones and the committee took that very seriously seriously enough that we actually commissioned a whole new demographic study instead of using the data from the school space study because we really wanted to have sort of as, as current information as we could in terms of planning this out and we're pretty comfortable with the idea that what we're building is going to adequately house uh, with some fluxes uh, the, the kids that are coming through things like you mentioned like the magnet effect I think are imponderables I will say my own bias is that with the upgrading of other school systems in the area that effect is going to be less probably we're going to be in a more competitive market if you will uh, I, I think we're going to be very competitive but we're going to be in a more competitive market so it's going to be um, uh, there, there will be some of that but I, I, it's hard to say are we buying a problem with more flat roofs yeah, I was going to ask about the roofs. They're all, I'll let the, They're all Well, I'll let the architects answer That's why I turned the architect. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, John. Um, today's flat roofs are significantly different from the flat roofs that were put on these buildings 30, 40, or 50 years ago. Today's so-called flat roofs, and of course they're not flat, <clears throat> they're internally drained. Uh, they're pitched into drains. They are covered with uh, what's called a single membrane uh, roofing uh, fabric very, very thick, <coughs> which comes in 12 foot wide sheets, which goes down and then the, the uh, seams are bonded and then uh, ballasted overhead. Whereas the previous uh, so-called flat roofs were laid up layers of felt and asphalt. Uh, and of course, it was, it was probably the worst job on the building from a construction trade standpoint. And you had the least skilled labor up there doing it. It was always in the summer and it was 95 degrees so you can be sure that was where you were going to have problems, and, and, uh, and that really has, you know, has been the case. With today's current technology on flat roofs, we have very few callback problems uh, with regards to the, those kinds of issues. Also, uh, the alternative, of course, are, are pitched roofs. And in a school building, you typically get a very large uh, mass of a building. In other words, you have a very wide uh, uh, body cover in a wide span. So in order to, to, to do that, you end up with a very tall pitched roof. Uh, and that, of course, collects a lot of snow, which eventually comes down. And in some cases, uh, gets uh, so bad that it covers up the uh, windows when it comes off the roof. So it's, 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 uh, you have to look at the, uh, the pluses and minuses of both systems. Uh, in this case here, I would suggest that the uh, the single membrane, so-called flat roof, is is the best judgment that we could that we could give. How much of this building will be used after you discard this on the top floor? The main floor, the one that How is, many? you know, that someone that's the regular, I guess, was in initial high school classrooms, um, and it will be renovated. Of course, um, personally, I think it has a charm and it's worth renovation. That will be um, largely the sixth grade. We'll get uh, the sixth grade science rooms, the sixth grade special ed room, and then five sixth grade classrooms. Also, the exterior of this building will be renovated. You know, right. window replacement. We will fix that pillar. Right. <laughs> Is it worth fixing the pillar? That's my question. Is it worth going to all that expense to fix a, a, a pillar? It, well, even though it does have charm and all that. I don't know what the alternative would be. Well, I think it is, and I think the committee felt strongly that uh, the building uh, had an architectural place in the community. Uh, a few of the members of the committee graduated from it. <laughs> that, was, that was somewhat arbitrary. Uh, uh, but yes, I mean, it was the judgment of the committee, and we concur that it does architecturally have significance in the community, and, and it is basically sound. I mean, it has had a lot of problems with water penetration, at the entrance and the wooden portions of the building. It's about to fall down that hole right there. <laughs> and the windows. And, and we know about the perimeter water problems, uh, which delivers water down here occasionally. Uh, but those are all technical problems which can be dealt with. 
but is it too expensive? Is it is it is it worth spending that money on it from an architectural standpoint? Uh, we feel it is. Yeah. I want one thing about renovation too is that the rooms upstairs are much more generous than today's school codes call for. Of course, with local money, you have more options. You can build more if you want. But if you were going through, we still have to meet all the codes. But at the same time, we could have larger uh, elect to have larger rooms at the committee. I mean, if the community is willing to pay for them. But in renovating, we have a number of rooms that definitely exceed the what, what's now required because in the old days you had more kids per class, so classrooms were built bigger, and that's certainly true in the, in the floor upstairs. It's also true in part of Pond Cove. It's not true in Lund. Um, and uh, so we actually get some bigger classes by the renovation project than we would in the typical construction. Another uh, piece of the of the uh, decision to save this building uh, was that we were very much aware of uh, some pressure from the town center uh, planning people and the planning board that this, you know, that this sort of fit into that overall plan. And I think there's no more, there's no other building in this town center, if you will, that is uh, as attractive and as much a part of the town center as uh, as any. So we were aware that that was a priority external to the project that. Uh, other members, other parts of the community wanted us to, you know, be mindful of. The other thing was to bring some kind of cohesive style to a hodgepodge of railroad buildings without going very dramatic and, and being very conscious of conscious. And I think what we've tried to do in maintaining that building is to, to bring the same kind of style to the rest of the middle school and then to some degree keep the elementary so it has its own distinct personality, um, more of a modern, modern approach, which is what it is. It's, that was one of the issues. Was you know, by linking the buildings, you now have no identity to the buildings. And one of the things I think that that really sold the committee was if it, somehow we could keep the styles separate, <coughs> and have some unity and save some money combined spaces and yet allow for some swing space for for the problems we've had in the past of having to move classes um, and that was why we tried to reconfigure just within the buildings where we would put classes especially in the middle school moving the seventh and eighth grade to the 30s building so that left the fifth grade down where essentially the, um, the sixth and seventh and eighth grade are now so that if you had to use that swing space of bringing you, your elementary suddenly grew the fact that you had to expand into somewhere else you could swing to where the fifth grade was and still keep the school separate so they had their own identity. I, I saw a budget, and I don't even remember where I saw it. I think it was put together by SMRT. It was kind of the line item for construction and then FF&E and those sorts of things. Will this project be run kind of on a line item basis? One of my concerns, I alluded to a little bit when we were talking about contingencies, but I would hate to see other line items robbed because construction and design ran over. So that things, for instance, and, and I don't remember what the numbers were, but I think there was a, a series of things included, such as furniture, fixtures, and equipment. And I'd hate to see those items robbed because Construction has overruns, and I'm just curious as to administratively, if the bond passes, um, <coughs> you know, for instance, if construction, um, if the construction budget starts running over, and, and realizing <coughs> asbestos remediation is a an integral part related to that, do you shortchange the? You steal a little bit out of asbestos and deal with that differently so that you get the building built and therefore we deal with asbestos later on as a capital project down the road. I mean, it's a common kind of, you know. Well, we and I don't know if there are any other ones in here, you know, any reversible sites. I, I think the bottom line is that the bond issue is for $11.7 million and the project has to be managed within the $11.7 million. Yeah, but my, my concern has not so much to do with managing to an $11.7 million, but, and again, I haven't 
gone through sure. this whole thing. What's the scope? What's the definition? What's the what's spec? And these are very broad categories. And I've expressed the concern that I don't think the construction contingency, design contingency is large enough given the, the extent of the renovation that I think we're talking about. We're not talking new construction. I would have expected something at this stage of design to be somewhere in the order of 20 to 30% for both design and construction. And as, as you mentioned, that that would, as you got further along in the design process, through de design development and whatnot, you would expect those contingencies to burn down, but you would also generally see some of that money allocated towards the project. Can you give them some sense of how you came? We, we understand the renovation costs for square footage, but how you came about for major renovation of systems and that be prepared against the project for the bin So. We have, they have some sense of what these have cost in other systems, in other renovation projects. But it's still, if I'm not mistaken, your takeoffs were still done largely on a square foot basis. And I understand the accuracy associated with that. And, and no two school renovation projects are going to be the same as, you know, if you're talking new construction, I, you know, it's a different thing. Build a new school, build a new school. It's, so even in new construction, there's quite a variety. You, you can have a variety, but given Brunswick High School versus Ellsworth High School, it was a ten dollars a square foot difference due completely to the structural system that was selected for Ellsworth. They're both new construction. No, no, I understand. But you're dealing with guys start knocking down walls, and they're going to say, right. "Oh, geez, we didn't know that was here." Yep. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, design starts. You guys have to redesign. I mean, it's just the nature of the beast, and I understand that. This building has been studied quite a lot uh, by a variety of architectural engineering firms. There's a lot of data available. There's a lot of exist uh, of uh, the we have most almost 95 percent of the construction documents for all of these buildings. We have. And there hasn't been a lot of changes to those systems uh, in those 30 years. Uh, surprisingly enough, the other the, the next largest item in the uh, in the budget is the movable equipment. Uh, number $900,000. And, and these numbers that go beyond the construction really are, a, are, are generated from a formula that the state uses for coming up with the total project cost. That $900,000, for example, is not the result of doing an exhaustive inventory of tables and chairs that we see around us and which of those are going to be used. So that is somewhat of a soft number based on the state averages for projects of this type. All right, but in terms of like movable equipment and, and that's assuming right. that's tabled, I would hate to see, for instance, uh, by way of example, $100,000, $200,000 move out of that line item for tables that are deemed probably necessary um, down to cover other things. And then a year or two down the line, all of a sudden there's a request, geez, we need new tables. Can I just make a point? Uh, <clears throat> and I, I guess this is, well, first of all, this is my first experience on a building project like this. Uh, but uh, so I don't know what the norms are, but from what Connie has told us, uh, who's been in a number of different projects, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but normally for a public project like this, the level of detail that's arrived at is much less. In other words, your, your point has been that the project you've been involved with in the past have uh, not gotten to even this level of detail by a long stretch. Uh, so yeah. see what what happens with, with schools that this is concept design we do not have the money to commission architects to do all the working drawings and all the specs and go out to bid so the typical practice for schools is to get far enough into the concept design so that there is a, a reasonably safe figure that we can go forward to the community for concept design and I suppose, I mean, if I were sitting on top of a private business and I knew I could capitalize and I could deal with it in a somewhat different way, and I knew I had $500,000 at my disposal to uh, get, get further down the specification and bid route before I had to have a real go out for a referendum, but we're publicly funded. No, no, I understand, Connie. I, I, I think my, my point's missed a little bit okay. in the sense of if we spend monies and and I think I think your operational and your capital monies for schools are kind of intermingled. Yeah. And 
earlier tonight, you mentioned the cost of this renovation per pupil versus other communities yeah. being substantially less. All right, which, okay, it sounds like it will be, but there's a lot of unknowns. As you right. mentioned, you're still, I don't even know if you're at schematics at this point, but you're very early in on the design. And as I mentioned at the very beginning, I have concerns about curriculum. And I wanna make sure that the school construction project comes in where it should come in. Right. So as not to jeopardize things that I feel as important as this is. I, I, I think but it's really important yeah. right now to note that not only will the building committee still be in on this, but from the very beginning there have been administrators and teachers um, sitting in on all these meetings and that will continue to make sure that you know we're building a school that is going to meet the educational needs it's not just a you know building where people come in and do their banking and leave i mean this is a school and you know the process will will continue to take the needs of of the educators and the children um, uh, in, I'm sorry, I, I don't think I'm making my point. Uh, I think I yeah, understand. I, you want to make sure that, that we have the money to run the school <laughs> Two side years of the business from now, and not I be buying it tables, over I here want to be buying the, textbooks. I think, I, I think I, Yeah, I'd like to address that. Uh, the, the referendum, of course, gives us a bottom line number, a top number uh, that we can spend. Uh, the committee, in looking at uh, the overall budget, tried to address every issue and be reasonable in the amount that we budgeted for those line items. Uh, we know that the tough job for us is, is really going to be in the next phase once this thing is approved because those choices that we will have to make when we find that one line item uh, may be over budget uh, for whatever the reasons are uh, and we have to uh, make decisions to either incorporate that or try to reduce that line uh, because there are other uh, concerns or priorities uh, that that will come forth. What we did look at the, at the furnishings budget is that uh, we certainly will have furnishings here uh, that we can reuse, uh, but we will have new furnishings, uh, particularly in some of the new space. The new gym for the elementary school certainly needs furnishings. Uh, and I think those choices, uh, as we get into the details, will be made. Uh, and our goal is to be able to have a, a complete facility that's operational uh, and if we run short on a few items then we may have to defer uh, some things but but it, everything would be prioritized and I, and I think another reasonable expectation is that the I understand your point about the commingling of operational capital costs uh, I think a reasonable expectation though is that the operational side is going to go down these buildings are going to be much more efficient to maintain uh, and uh, heating costs, et cetera, et cetera. So our, I think it's not unreasonable to expect that. Uh, so, you know, there's a little cushion there. But these, these funds are not commingled with the operating budgets. No, no, these I, funds, you know, are, are obviously a separate. No, I understand. I think in looking at the next phase, I think this community needs to look at what, what the, complex, the composition of the building committee is. You have a construction engineer who's the chairman who's built schools have a architect build schools, you have an engineering lawyer who's done contracts, who, who also served as the school space study committee chairman. You have a superintendent who's done some school construction and school renovation. And you've got some non-professional people who are there for mainly the academic, to make sure that the academic aspect is, isn't lost in the process. So I think you've got, this town's very fortunate to have the composition of this kind of committee, because a lot of towns don't. It becomes a very political committee, and there are factions. And I think the committee as a whole has, has worked very well together. And they've tried to get as much expertise, if they didn't have it within the committee, from outside the committee. And involving the staff right from the beginning, of having staff representatives there right from the first meeting, and they were there, for every meeting, and they had their input, and the committee allowed them to have their input and to explain things so that we became more knowledgeable. And I, that's not always the process uh, in an initial school study or a school space committee right from the beginning. One, one, one thing, if, I'm, if I might add, uh, is to really understand the process that we undertook because we, we the, looking at the plan, 
uh, as we presented it now doesn't tell the whole story. Uh, and particularly if you if you don't have the, the current plan side by side or even overlaid over the existing plan, uh, we did not start with looking at how to add uh, square footage to the building. What we looked at, uh, the, the, the first and foremost item was the programming. Uh, what were the programming requirements to meet the educational program? That's where we started from, uh, and we developed that programming. Uh, then the architects developed the square footage required <coughs> to meet the program. Uh, once that was accomplished, then they started generating plans uh, of how to uh, reorganize the buildings and use the space that we had appropriately, uh, plus what we needed to do for addition. So uh, that's the reason we have additions for the uh, seventh and eighth grade uh, in that particular location, in the media center, et cetera. So that uh, it's, and I've had a number of uh, people ask me, uh, well, where is all the new classroom space? Well, actually, it is there, but it's tucked in, uh, part of it is, is taking out administration space and then putting in classroom space for the fifth uh, grade, for example. Now the classrooms and the science rooms are all together, uh, and they're not just a couple of classrooms here and a couple of classrooms there. So yeah, that's how the process uh, was undertaken, and that's the main reason we don't have options. Uh, we, we really focused in and found that this was the plan that, that solved problems. I think one of your other concerns is you'd like us to spend more time working on curriculum, basically. Focus on the curriculum, not, not just on the buildings. It's been very frustrating, uh, I'll say, for me as chairman of the school board right now, that this has been, you know, a just, it's had to be an obsession to get this problem taken care of. If we don't get this problem taken care of in November, we're going to have to continue to work on it and be distracted from you know, working on the educational programs until it's passed because right now, you know, one thing we really haven't talked about is, um, you know, there have been a lot of near misses with kids being seriously hurt and, you know, we could have something happen someday. I can't in good conscience, um, you know, act, you know, worry about other things while we have that big physical danger looming over people's heads. It wouldn't be responsible. Um, I would like nothing better than to be able to go back to talking about <laughs> more about the educational programs. Um, so, you know, that's one big reason I hope this passes because it, it, it has become an all-consuming um, effort here and I think it, it needs to be, but I think we really need to get on with it and get back to focusing on, on the educational program. Uh, may I get back to a question about the operating budget and the savings that we're going to have as we, we replace the functionally obsolete systems that we have? One of the misconceptions of a lot of people in the community, a lot of it has to do with when you read a lot, like in the um, supplement, about the program, maybe you miss one little thing. And that is that a lot of people in this community are looking at this as a 20-year mortgage. And I find that every time I point out to people that we have a two-year phase-in period, and then year three after passage, the payments actually go down, I think that it's very important that people understand that the bond is different from your home mortgage and that the bond principle remains constant, yet the interest rate actually does decrease. And I think that one of the things that scares people is they're looking at this $332 or $800, depending on where you live, payment for the next 20 years. And that's only year two or three years from now. And if uh, you know, we somehow highlighted or emphasized that point, or at least the people in this room um, knew it if they didn't know it before. I mean, I think that a lot of people who didn't like it, when I explained to them, we would have savings in our operational budget, um, and it's only that high figure that one year. All of a sudden, they said, well, let me reread it. So it is there in the paper, but a lot of people have missed it um, because it is just as a footnote. So. Well, the impact on the tax rate is a, is a hard issue because, for instance, were we to borrow the money today, it would be 5%, which is 6.4, I think it is, million instead of 7.7%. 7 uh, I mean, that's a, that's a difference right there, which would make a difference in the impact. Um, obviously, if we waited and go, if the community goes out in a couple of years and the interest rate has gone up to 7, it's 
eight million, not seven million. So that I mean that right off makes a difference. Uh, there are other factors. I mean, if in fact the state uh, funding formula went back to what it's supposed to be, uh, we were supposed to get another four hundred thousand dollars in subsidy this year, which we didn't get. Uh, we got some of it. We didn't certainly get the full 400. Um, it's possible. I mean, you know, I'm, I, I certainly am not going to stand being a predictive, but I'm merely saying that those are factors that are not reflected in that rate. I mean, we got $400,000 more subsidy, and the interest rates were less, and that 330 figure goes down considerably. But those are, are things that I don't feel responsible standing up and telling people, gee, this might happen. I don't mind mentioning it in a small meeting like this, but that's where the tax impact is very difficult to predict because there are other factors. I will also uh, point out that as one of the co-authors of the original, the original brochure that came out that I think led to some of that confusion. We weren't trying to confuse or mislead people. It was strictly for uh, purposes of simplicity and also space. Uh, that we just listed it out that far, and I think the new direct mail piece that just came out today uh, gets into some more detail about that, and, and I think clarifies that. So everybody should be getting that in the mail. Is this the first one? No, that's, that's the second. second. That's the second. Yeah. And I think your point is well made. That message really needs to be made a little bit louder and clearer to the people. Well, I said it to the reporter. I don't know if she'll print it, but. We'll see what's in tomorrow's well, paper. Well, it did say, it, did say it, yeah. it, it was in a yeah, box. Yeah, I, I saw, I did see but that. But I read the fine print. Yeah, <laughs> but I, I mean, I, I still, think still it's additional offices. Yeah, I really think, I mean, I tell everybody that whether I start with, well, I'm sure you know that, but, and a lot of people say thank you. I didn't know that, so. So if everyone in this room could <laughs> say that to at least two people by tomorrow. <laughs> So like Clinton's health plan? Yeah, you don't get me going. Medicaid. I've been doing that. I think one thing that uh, everybody has forgotten and why everybody is so upset is the increase in the taxes, quote for quote, is I think everyone has forgotten or has taken for granted that Cape taxes are lower than surrounding communities and we are used to paying less per thousand than any other surrounding community. I mean compared to Portland, so I'm saying Portland property, I mean they used to pay a thousand dollars more a year. It's true and it's but it's hard. I, I've had discussions with people about that and and um, they usually point out that they, some of the value of property here may be higher and so on. So um, it's hard, very difficult, but I appreciate you mentioning it because I've lived in other places back along, although I've lived here in Cape for over 20 years, so I don't have, well, I certainly see my taxes go. Cool. But uh, I think, uh, I, but I've worked in other communities and, and, and absolutely, I mean, this is $2 give or take a little more on the tax rate. I, in the 80s, I saw the school district I was in and every other district I knew for, at some point was facing some kind of crisis and some of it was building and some of it was curriculum and some of it was this or that. Um, but I can remember bringing in those $2 or close to $2 raises along with the town budget. And um, so, I mean, this is not, it is not totally out of whack for what the area has had to deal with in the last few years. Uh, I know that doesn't soften the impact. I know it doesn't make it any more palatable, but it is certainly um, one of those things that other communities have been dealing with too, for what consolation there is in that. Mm -hmm. Just administratively, how does, it, how does it work in terms of what kind of, is there a minimum vote that you need to get out at the referendum? It means that so whoever turns up, the majority of whoever turns up, if 100 people show up, 51 votes. Or 99. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, well, whatever. They won't take 99. <laughs> like that. <laughs> it, it is, I, I would just like to emphasize for the health of the school district, um, this problem has been draining the energy and sapping the life out of this district more than a lot of people realize. I mean, every day, teachers are coming to work, children are coming to their work. 
um, in settings that in sometimes just little minimal ways and sometimes more obvious ways are sapping their ability to learn in the setting and that is a major curriculum issue. Uh, teachers are definitely having to stand on their heads in some cases in order to do things they should be able to do as a matter of fact. Um, and I think that there would be an opportunity for the community to pick up on some of the vision, some of the excitement about learning that is certainly here, um, and to, you know, I like that word synergy. I mean, it would be one of those moments. This is two thirds of the school system, two thirds of the kids, two thirds of the staff, two thirds of the building. I mean, it could have a major impact in giving people a sense of vision for the future. Uh, and I think it's well worth doing. The other thing is that this, people really need to think about how much of the lifeblood of the community is in these schools. We don't have some flagship business or, you know, we have the, the lighthouse, but, you know, our people energy and people power is right in these buildings. And it was uh, coincidentally on my way over here, I was li listening to uh, public radio and somebody was quoting Winston Churchill. I'll see if I can get it right, but it so struck me about, um, what this project means, and he said, uh, we, make, we make a living from what we get. We make a life from what we give. And I think that is so pertinent to the situation we have here. Wasn't that perfect? I couldn't believe it. I was driving <laughs> the driveway. But really, I mean, you know, we're, nobody wants to pay more on their taxes, but when you look around these buildings and you see the conditions in here, it's not right to do this to our kids. And every other community around here has already faced up to it. And I'd like to think that we can do it. Yeah. Well, just on that sentiment, we, we spent $400 last year because our son um, refused to go to the bathroom because of the smell. And he got a, um, a blockage that we had to work out medically. And we have to keep monitoring it now every month. But it's, it's starting again, and he refuses to go into the boys' room because of the smell. And we keep telling him, you got to go, though. You, know, you don't have a and choice. And you know, the really but. sad part about it is that I, you know, uh, and I, I saw Sue here, she's done a remarkable job, as well as some other people, in helping all of us to reorganize. And, and they are cleaning those bathrooms. I mean, if I thought well, I this like was... I like that film. Now I'm understanding that it's not a question of them not being clean. You just can't. It's, it's, well, it's it it's not, a floor problem. It is not it's there. even, even the smell though that is there. that shows the the uh, rust on the thing. And of course, you know, honestly, in an ordinary circumstance, we of course would replace those. But the fact of the matter is, is another fifty, you know, twenty five thousand to go through the whole building and so on. And, and you question how much of that really should be done when we ought to be doing it the whole way. But the real smell problem and the dis Bear that we all have about that facility is in the floorboards, and that is a major problem. And this is this is really a, a problem that feeds on itself because if you've got facilities that are shabby, the kids aren't going to respect them, and the kids aren't going to feel respected either, and it just builds on itself. And if they don't respect it, they're going they're not going to treat it well, and it just gets worse and worse and worse. And that's where we're at, and we're on this slow, not so slow maybe downward spiral in terms of that. It's, uh, I'm struck when I've talked in the last few weeks with groups of children, some of them here happen to be in a high school class. They just take this for granted. It's as if they were camping out. <laughs> now, I mean, you know, that I'd rather camp out. <laughs> I think they would rather camp out. But I mean, they, to some degree, and I think Charles said this at one of our board meetings, you have to get to the high school in this system before you go to a decent building. It's like you have to graduate from the eighth grade to go to a building that has a science lab and or, a or and a decent cafeteria. <laughs> I mean, uh, I I just question whether that's a message we really want to give our kids. Did you have a point? Well, it was even more a question. Um, the high school is 21. 23 years old. Okay. Um, 22. How about any ballpark for when we're going to need to spend a lot of money on the high school? Well, what I, I have, of course, worried about that, and I have been looking at the records. There were some repairs done in the high school that were really part of the, um, some of the difficulties that cropped up in construction. For instance, in the 80s, there were uh, repairs. The gym floor was replaced. There was a wall that had been problematic. Um, there was something else that I escaping me at the moment. And some of, of that work was done 
where the settlement through construction funds and so on. So to some degree, there was some monitoring going on while the bond was still being paid and while the state was still involved as a kind of overseer of that project. Um, what has been called to my attention last year in very dramatic shape was the heating. We had not been doing sufficient um, preventive maintenance, but we now have a program and we are doing it. And I suspect that we will continue to see some problems this winter, but we should have a handle on it by the end of the winter. I would, that's my hope. No there, the outside stuff that I mentioned earlier <coughs> is more problematic. I don't, from what I've been told, that's not a huge ticket item. Um, but right now, it is, I don't have a dollar for you. Well, knowing that <coughs> these facilities, or K through eight, uh, one through eight, um, have such an inefficient shell, um, on a pot, well, how, how far out of <coughs> energy efficient is the high school as far as windows? Well, it's um, certainly better. The windows do need to be replaced, and the uh, it was a much more substantial building. It was built in 1970 at a cost of almost $4 million. One of these brochures, I said $3 million. That was the local effort. I then did some more uh, work, and I realized that there was about another eight hundred, six hundred, seven hundred thousand dollars that came from state funds. So it was really a $4 million <laughs> project and translated into uh, $93. That's a 15 probably easily a $15 million project. We built Lunt Building for 181, translate that $1962 into 93, and I think it's less than a million or close to a million, but not quite. Uh, it was a much more substantial building. Uh, therefore, for instance, when that was re-roofed and I had the structural engineers go in there to check it, uh, the structure was sufficient, even though it hadn't been checked and hadn't been uh, uh, part of the project to figure it out in advance, uh, the structure was sufficient to meet code even for today with the exception of one roof, which we now have to monitor and shovel. And the next time we re-roof, uh, we'll bring up, it's not very far off, but it's far enough off so that it will have to eventually be brought up. Uh, so I think that, that hopefully is a reassuring uh, set of statistics. Uh, do you think that it's a... Uh got 20 years in this bond, if we pass it, um, it's probably, how far can I, it's not going to go 43 years without a major repair, I would think. You mean the high school? Yes. That's yeah. probably true. I wouldn't know what would give, if you're asking me well, to guess what's going to give out. No, it, I'm not asking that. Is your, is your comfort level uh, oh, that we'll probably have to have something along the way to help the high school? Well, I think there certainly is. It's, it's obvious it would have to be the kinds of things that with a prudent program we can put into the operational budget, but we'd have to resist the temptation to cut it out of the operational budget in a bad year. And the community would have to be willing to accept the fact that this is the time to do that and not to put it off and so on. Um, and I think that this is a lesson that hopefully is you know out there and we could probably all profit from it. So there's an ongoing concern too is that the, the, the history of this district has shown that the buildings are, are not all school district buildings are not important although i happen to have come from a district where the buildings were, were maintained and, and there's always this if not older and they're in excellent working condition uh, i would like to address the school board to do uh, to, 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 to put a, a spirit statement or something in, 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 from the school board that that, that, that they would that they would realize the past issues of, of maintenance of buildings and would, 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 would aver that they believe that that's a very important aspect of any budget and would hope that the school boards would, in the future would also do this. Because if not, we're going to just be spinning and be doing it again. It's going to be constant. Well, I, think, I don't think you have a problem with the school board you have right now. Yeah. But there we is change turnover. Right. And it's important for people to, you know, hold school boards to a standard. I think that's fair for the community to do that. It's and amazing. you should insist on having people run who are willing to uh, deal with these issues and realize that, you know, it's not glamorous to deal with the buildings. But look what the situation we've gotten in now. We can't do anything but deal with the buildings. But it's so. amazing that, that once a, a, a board starts making a statement of, this is an, uh, of intent, how that intent can carry. 
That's true, I, but, but I, I still think, think it's up to the voters to hold the school board. Well, I think that's the other issue. I'm not sure the voters right. knew it. This is, I mean, we knew the building was bad. But we didn't right. know everything was right, going but on. It's good this to could have been done 15 memory. years. There's, there's another watchdog out there. It's called the town council. I've been on the board for four and a half years, and for four and a half years, I've heard, where's your five-year <laughs> deferred maintenance plan? And that's before the board even looked at what really was structurally wrong. And they, they started to make an attempt when I first came on the board to do something because the buildings were leaking. So they, they felt with a band-aid approach we could start to do some deferred maintenance and they got into roofing and it wasn't done correctly. So the first thing that was wrong, there was never a detailed study of these buildings ever done. They were trying to do, respond to public pressure to do something about the buildings finally after many years of not doing anything. So I think, I think the town council is very cognizant of this. And they also have Year plan usually. As, as an example of how evanescent that kind of commitment can be, I had the opportunity to speak to a former superintendent uh, of the system back to the late 70s, early 80s, I guess, who told me that the town council came to him and said, you should have a five-year maintenance plan. And the, town, and the school boards agreed, and they put forth a five-year maintenance plan, a you know, mission statement, whatever, and here we are. I have seen it. <laughs> and and, and you know, I, I found it, and it was and it was a nice piece of work. It wasn't as detailed. And but the other thing that in the early '80s, these buildings that you know this whole national issue of baby boomer buildings, which were really prefabs of their day, and the extent to which they were going to become partly because of energy codes and so on, were going to become highly problematic was was realized in the early '80s by districts that were being pushed by increased enrollment and you began to see it throughout this the state wave after wave of a combination of renovation and additions um, and that's become the school architecture of a, a major part of the way in which districts are trying to deal with that so that's an extra problem that wasn't reflected in that early 80s uh, long-range maintenance and I think to be honest it's an overwhelming problem who would take it on if you didn't have to. <laughs> and just yeah. to just speak to Ann's concern about the turnover of boards, next May, I will become your senior board member, five years on the board. That would have been a complete turnover of people in the last five years of seven people. That doesn't make for a very long institutional memory. And you can, and, and I do think it's important that you have it in, in your mission statement or whatever, and, you, and every year you build it into your budget. But there's a lot of pressure out there, pressure from a lot of groups who want different things. And I think the tendency in the past has been, okay, let's you know, focus all our money here. And um, the community really needs to insist upon uh, candidates who, who understand the importance of keeping a balance in the system. You can't put all your money into one thing and not expect something else to go off the deep end. And um, fortunately, I think that's what happened. Not because the people who were on the board before weren't well-meaning. They were doing what they thought the community wanted. Um, but you know, you've got to have a longer-term memory than you know just the current demands on the system. I think that's the important thing. Well, thank you very much for coming. Appreciate thank you. it. <laughs> and please follow. <laughs> <laughs> so can I put a sign on your line? Oh, yes, I wish I had one, but it's in the other car. <laughs>